So, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jose, Eric, the work that uh, I'm going to present here, uh, entitled Matter Matters, Sacred Bread and Breads and Liturgical Placemaking in Modern Edinburgh, is part of a wider project that um, I'm currently working on, uh, entitled Faith on the Move, Relocating and Dislocating Religious Landscapes, and in a way, it's an amalgamation of my architectural, theological, academic, and pastoral um, commitments. Thanks be to God, I have the blessing. I'm given the blessing to do that. So I will start. The church as the body of Christ is constantly repeated in the scriptures, believed and worshipped in liturgical life, and fully embodied in the core sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ during the divine liturgy, inviting the faithful to partake of them in a condition of union with the divine and with each other as members of the same body. The consecrated gifts are consumed and fully integrated in the body and soul of the communicant. This presentation explores the church as a body of Christ through the liturgical role of bread in church life. Mm -hmm. It's worshiping, making, ritual, preparation, Eucharistic change and consumption are a series of interconnected acts embodying the body of Christ as an open-ended act of unification in it. The presentation will illustrate its points through one of the worshipping places of the multinational Orthodox Church of St. Andrews in Edinburgh, a reappropriated 18th century school classroom, as it is a representative example of how liturgical placemaking emerges in the space-time of ritual choreographies performed by people coming from different places, immigrants and locals. The notion of sacrifice as combined with the shared act of communal meals plays an important role in different religious traditions, defining the interaction between the giver and the receiver, the host and the guest. Food thus is a sacrificial gift prepared and given by a host to the participants, activating the interrelationship between two or more individuals. This offering gives birth to what Gerardus van der Loh, a phenomenologist of religion, calls a mystic power which establishes communion, as it is shared and always open to a possible return gift. Carrying the dynamics of a reciprocal interaction, the gift itself becomes the heart of a sacrificial act. It's flowing through acts and body subjects plays the most important role in the whole process and is also used in different religious traditions to symbolize the affirmation of the relation between man and God. Religious meals are also included in the Old and New Testaments, always connected to the revelation of the divine. Through the parable of the great dinner, Jesus Christ introduced the importance of ritual meals as embodiments of his sacrifice. Moreover, in the Last Supper, he prefigured the Eucharist, showing the way people liturgically retrieve future communion with the Trinitarian God. Another typical example is that during the way to Emmaus, Jesus was not recognized by his followers until, quote, he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, end quote, as mentioned in Luke 24, 30 confirming in this way the role that communal meals can play in the liturgical life of the faithful. According to Dennis Smith, early Christian meals as depicted in the scriptures and linked with ancient Greek food rituals open a religious culture of reciprocal sharing. The combination of the banquet and the drinking event of the ancient symposiums may also be connected in terms of borrowing ritual schemes as vehicles of religious ideas to the prefiguration of the Eucharist through the mystical supper described by the evangelists. This is related to the agape, love, the ancient Christian religious communal meals 
in which the Eucharist used to take place. Hence, communal meals are connected to the, the reaffirmation of the community through the sharing of religious meanings. The sacrificial qualities of the sharing of the same food and the way that different people are distributed during this process embody different qualities of the community's character. Meals are about a living sense of communita, to use Victor and Edith Turner's term, taking place during them that has transformative dynamics for the participants. In this context, loaves of bread, either a big one or five smaller ones, are prepared for every Holy Eucharist. Three key acts are examined here, the making of them, the ritual preparation taking place before the beginning of the divine liturgy, referred either as proscomidia or processes, and their consecration during the divine liturgy. While the first is a more informal but still important process, the second and third ones have a settled place in the order of the liturgy with specific texts and acts performing them. A fourth stage is also added to them that involves the keeping of reserved holy gifts on the holy altar to be used if they are needed, acute conditions of illness, exile, and so forth. The reserved holy gifts are consecrated during the holy week of Easter, dried up, and remain on the altar as open-ended liturgical acts. These different bread rituals take place at specific spaces that are either architecturally incorporated in the church building or are held at home, showing a material connection between the life in the church building and beyond it. The consecration of the holy gifts and the keeping of the reserved gifts take place on the holy altar, the focal point of church architecture, the ritual preparation at the preparation niche called also pastophorion, on the north side of the sanctuary and the making at the devotee's home. In parallel, blessed bread is also distributed to the devotees at the end of the divine liturgy and can take it home as well and rituals such as the Serbian Slava, another bread ritual, can take place both at the church and at home. It is normal for some particular persons to be responsible for the baking of the bread or the breads to be used as the holy gifts. Their making needs to meet specific requirements. It needs to be of thick texture, to have been sealed with a specific stamp that maps the ritual indicating the pieces of the bread that will be dedicated to become the lamp to commemorate the Mother of God, hierarchical and clerical orders, bodiless powers and saints, as well as living and dead members of the church. The usual practice is not to use dry yeast, but sorodou made with water from the great blessing of the waters of Epiphany on the 6th of January. Depending the cultural background, specific prayers might be said during its making, while the space needs to be clean, tidy and sensed before the beginning of the process. In some cases, portable icons and lit oil candles might be part of the setting, adding informal ritualistic element in its making. In the so-called Orthodox countries, such as Greece and Russia, commercialization of making and selling loaves of bread for the Holy Communion by small-scale bakeries is sometimes causing a disturbance in the required prayerful making of them, as well as might end up with receiving large numbers of offerings that can be hardly used in one service. A recipe is memorized in the body, the hands and the body posture of making a bread, and the mind of remembering amounts and sequence of actions. It is brought together with the immigrant and also taught to, to others. It is not rare for people from Greece, Romania, Russia, Ukraine to bring offerings to the church for the liturgy according to the way they remember their relatives doing it or even themselves back in their home countries. In parallel, locals also learn by them becoming one family in the preparation of the gifts. The ritual preparation of the holy gifts named proskomidi from the Greek word for bringing forth or prophecies from the Greek word for pre-placing 
is an embodiment of the birth of the Lord, the crucifixion, and the gathering of all the believers as members of his body through their commemoration. Appropriately prepared bread sealed with the Christian symbols and known as the offerings together with wine and water are prepared for the coming Eucharist, encapsulating in its conduct scriptural space and time. The seal is of special importance, made of wood of good quality, in some cases brought together with other things in the suitcases of immigrants, it is a map of movements, a map of what pieces the priests should cut in the preparation, and a map of the way they will be placed on the tray to be ready for the consecration. This careful placement allows for the celebrant to make the, the minimum needed movements during the consecration, and hence in a way become the score of the choreography of the moving hands of the priest during these extremely important moments. The preparation is served in the one of the two pastophoria, the chambers in an early Christian church or current Eastern Orthodox churches that flank the holy altar, that are used as sacristies and are named diaconica, the southern one, Diakonikon, the southern one, and the process is the northern one and the one that we are currently studying. In the temple of the Old Testament, the pastophorio refers to the treasury and the priest's quarters. Since the fourth century, it regards the sacristy or sacristies at the eastern part of the church. A table belonging to the previous priest in charge of St. Andrew's family, carefully placed on the left side of the holy altar, is covered with a clean white tablecloth. On it, a candlestick with a big wax candle, and the vessels, the chalice and the tray, carefully covered, are waiting for the next preparation to take place there. The space in St. Andrew's is not purposefully designed, and things belonging to different people, clergy and parishioners are used to create what the place should look like according to inherited traditions through religious memory. The liturgical books include the proscomidi in the rites of preparation after preparatory prayers, vesting and hand washing. The processes takes place usually before the divine liturgy unless there is a hierarch presiding. In the latter case, the priest starts the ritual, leaving it incomplete for the hierarch to complete it during the divine liturgy. Recent scholarship has tended to ignore the preparation of the holy gifts as taking place quietly and not requiring the presence of the congregation. During the preparation and following the text and the inscribed symbols on the bread, the priest cuts out the lamp intended for the consecration and communion that is placed in the middle of the pattern and is flanked by the Mother of God and the, the pa, ba, bodiless powers and saints. Underneath there is the particle for the bishopric, clerical and monastic orders flanked by commemorated living and dead people represented by crumbs carefully placed by the priest while reading their names. Being universal in its character, the rite starts changing the loaf of the bread by taking out, in an architecturally we could possibly say in a liturgically stereotomic way, the parts that will play a protagonistic role during the liturgy. When finished, the remaining loaf of bread resembles a unique landscape created by the abstraction of material from it. This remaining bread, the negative spaces from the parts that are on the pattern on the tray, will be cut and distributed to the congregation at the end of the service as a blessing. The whole object is blessed and carefully consumed. The whole object, meaning the object, the material object of the, of the bread. Even before its consecration, the lamp is ritually processed in a universal way as deserved to a fully inclusive body of Christ. As Nikolai Gogol argues, quote, thus around this bread, which is the lamb representing Christ himself, is gathered his whole church, both triumphant in heaven and militant on earth, end quote. And while conducted in a sense of a clerical private act, it is fully open to everyone. 
In the same rite, the blood and water shed by our, our Lord are also combined and blessed in the chalice. It is impossible to think of the bread as disconnected by the wine and vice versa. As we will see later, warm water symbolizing the fervor of the Holy Spirit will be added later to make the union of the body and blood the mediation of a holy communion. The symbol of communion is the union of any contributing element in the sacrament, human and non-human. And if etymologically, symbol, symbolo, is about holding together meanings and realities, then in this case, we find one of the ultimate expressions of the term. The most important event in worship is the consecration of the holy gifts taking place on the holy altar during the prayer of Epiclesis, in which the priest is asking God to send the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, as the prayer says. For Nenan Milosevic, this act is symbolizing the resurrection of Christ as the body that up to them, that point was dead, bread, and wine becomes alive. The transformation of the gifts is a living testimony of a threefold present in which past and future also coexist. The text, the act, and their context, the space in which they take place, are a fully performative assemblage. What is said is acted, what is acted is contained, and what contains is acted and said. In this process, we see the now of memory, including future, something that while true for individual and communal identity, the activities in which it is fully unfold unfolded in such a dramatic way are rarely grasped and difficult to explain. For Deborah Lapton, quote, given that food is an element of the material world which embodies and organizes our relationship with the past in socially significant ways, the relationship between food, preferences and memory may be regarded as symbiotic. The taste, the smell, the texture of food can serve to trigger memories of previous food events and experiences around food while memory can serve to delimit food preferences and choices based on experiences, end quote. This symbolic value of transfiguring food during the div divine liturgy with symbol meaning symbiosis and holding together as we have already introduced, signifies the presence of a series of actions that relate to a constantly moving, open-ended liturgical communitas, that the aim of which is to transform individual and communities, gradually developing religious bonds with each other that go beyond cultural and national backgrounds, specificities of citizenship and geopolitical osmosis. The Holy Communion and the treasuring of reserved gifts are to the, to the mosaic of these acts. The transformation of the Holy Gifts takes place on a piece of fabric called andimension. Andimension stems from the Latin words for instead, anti, and table mensa, so an antimensa. It is always found on the Holy Altar, folded in square shape, on top of it stands the gospel that embodies the word of God, Jesus Christ. The undimension and the gospel are the absolutely needed objects for any space to be transformed into a holy place. The fabric holds relics sewn in it and on it the burial of Jesus Christ is depicted. It is unfolded at a particular moment of the divine liturgy, defining the context in which the consecration is going to happen. It remains open until the end of the liturgy and is folded again carefully to wait for the next one. Initially, the Andimension was a movable small table that was used for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist in and outside of the church building during expeditions or missions at least since the reign of Constantine the Great. 
The earliest mention of the word and dimension is found in the biography of St. Martin from Syracuse around 700 and is the movable holy altar on which the saint used to worship the divine liturgy. Since the early 9th century, the worship of the Holy Eucharist on consecrated wooden boards or shrouds, it was established when there was no holy altar either at all or altars not consecrated in a canonical way. Already in the 6th century, the Andic Chalcedons used to consecrate wooden boards instead of the holy altar and dimension as we know them now, carrying holy relics, started being widely used since the iconoclastic controversy and as the iconoclasts were against the veneration of holy relics and complete holy altars were used in divine liturgies on the move and under persecution. Gradually, the use of cloth and dementia was spread to become compulsory for any worship of the divine liturgy as we read in the 13th century canon that suggests the penalty of 70 prostrations for the priests that will serve the divine liturgy without using an andimension. The Eucharist is primarily a sacrament of communion. In the partaking of the holy mysteries, even the distinction between the priests and the congregation is erased, getting together in the performance of the one body of Christ. As Alexander Smelman suggests, during the Holy Communion we are all equally honored with them, with the Holy Mysteries, not as in the Old Testament when one food was for the priests and another for the people, and when it was not permitted to the people of that which was for the priest. Holy Communion is an act both individual and collective. From a specific prayer onwards, the prayer of Anaphora, even the prayers of the priests refer to the whole body of the church that we are and will be fully performed in the partaking of the transfigured offerings. In the holy gifts, we recognize the holy body and blood of Christ, the sacrifice offered by Christ on behalf of all and for all. In communion, we receive it with faith, hope and love in unity with Christ, a quote by Alexander Zmemon again. The communal reinforces the personal and the personal reinforces the communal. In a similar way that every single crumb of the offering organically merged with every other, being one and the whole at the same time, each of us is believed to be personally prepared and positioned in front of the Eucharist and simultaneously organically collected in Holy Communion with the others. Consuming the gifts, the individual as a body soul, becomes one with them and with the rest of the church. The bread and the wine is dissolved in their body and the sacramental union with each other is believed to be fulfilled in parallel as this acts and bodies a Christ-centered thanksgiving for the past, the present and the future in the transformative dynamics of sacramental reality. So here on the anchor icon, we see a very laborious artophorion, the, the vessel that keeps the reserved gifts on them. On the holy altar, we find the artophorion from a Greek compound meaning carrying the bread. The artophorion is one of the sacred objects of the Christian church. In it, we keep holy body and blood in portions that are used for extraordinary cases when a divine liturgy cannot be worshipped. A usual example is when a sick person needs to emergently receive communion. It is a rather old tradition of the Church, also included in the 13th canon of the First Ecumenical Synod. These gifts are prepared once per year during the Divine Liturgy of Great Thursday, when the Church commemorates the mystical supper. The priest consecrates two lamps, two cubic pieces of the, from the offerings, from two different offerings, when the second, after being immersed in the holy blood, is dried by the priest and kept for the rest of the year in the artophorion. Waiting on the holy altar, the body and blood of Christ testifies to an open-ended liturgical performance, a liturgy that does not stop with the ending phrase of a service, 
but extends to a lifelong process of embodying Christ through achieving communitas, communion. The bread and the wine define space-times of these transformative journeys. They testify to the involvement of both the body and the soul in worship and the reality of a sacrament, of sacramental mystery of union. At the end of the divine liturgy, antidoron, instead of the gift, meaning instead of the gift, is distributed to the faithful of the parish. Antidoron are parts of baked offerings that have been involved in the preparation of the holy gifts that will be consecrated into the body and blood of Christ during the liturgy. It is a long-standing tradition for people to take Antidoron back home, cut it into small pieces and have each of them with blessed water every morning. Antidoron is not the only part of the liturgy that moves from the church to the home. Bread rituals are well embedded in different Orthodox traditions. The preparation of a bread and its consecration at the church is completed with its return to the home as a transformed blessed object ready to be consumed and consecrated daily. This is also the case with the Slava, a Serbian Orthodox ritual. It is the family's annual ceremony and celebration of their patron saint, a ritual bread, Slavsky kolach, and the dish of boiled wheat, olive or zito, are prepared for the occasion, the latter being a symbol of the resurrection of Christ in memory of the dead family members. Small tables move around the space of the main church for these rituals to be served and in parallel parts of them also take place at home, extending the sacrality of the church to the private space of the individual and the family. Let us read parts of one of the interviews that I had with a member of the parish describing their Slava, a Serbian member of the parish of St. Andrews. Growing as a child in Serbia, I was introduced to Slava by my grandparents. Slava is something the family celebrates through generation and is passed usually onto a son from a father. However, it was usually the maternal side of the family who persisted with celebrations and kept it going. Grandmothers passed on the, passed on the famous recipes of baked beans, stew, bean paste, lava fish, holy bread, and colivo. My grandmother, who was a daughter of a priest, married my granddad, whose brother was a priest. She had accepted their Slava Day and celebrated St. Nicholas Day on both the 22nd May and the 19th of December, of, of December with the old calendar, as well as a couple of other saints very openly like it used to be the custom in villages in the first half of last century. From my mother's side, they have celebrated St. Nicholas too, as they lived in the city, they kept the celebrations within a family not to be seen in the 60s and 70s. Though all students and army recruits would cry and come home from their far cities for the family Slava gatherings. I remember all my family gathered together on the 19th of September in the grandparents' flat for an early afternoon Slava meal. The day we also celebrated our youngest cousin's name day, Nicholas, Nicola. Granddad, who had three daughters, had always said that he would pass the Slava onto youngest grandson, Nicola. The festivity of the Slava day evokes in particular emotions of gratefulness and thanksgiving for all we had received from God. The words granddad and mom later on used to say have since stuck in my mind. Kazi, Hvala, Bogu, Itera, Dalje. Keep thanking the Lord and move on. All my family, no matter how stranded or immeasurable in faith, would be present on the day. These were the happiest childhood memories. All would be seen crossing and singing the troparian to the saints, though we did not at all attend the liturgy that day. It wouldn't have been till the late 80s and early 90s that it became acceptable to be seen attending the liturgy, receiving the communion, and going to the church openly, although there were many who did go. 
Until then, things would have been done almost in secrecy with fear to be seen by the party members. Then again, it was one of those things people did the way they did and went on with it. This is a photograph of the Slava who celebrated at her place in Edinburgh. Loud children's voices, music playing and joyous singing would be heard from the grandparents' flood on that evening. It was a blessing to be together. After 2000, it almost became in fashion to celebrate Slava or go to a Slava celebration. St. Nicholas and St. Michael are the greatest patron saints in Serbia when half of the population celebrates either saints and the other half goes to the celebration. In my family today, we celebrate the eve of St. Nicholas with bread, wine and colliva under a candlelight. The following day, we would have a large family feast in the name of the saint with a table filled with fasting food and drinks, the smell of malt, rakia, and food tickling noses. This custom was continued locked after the granddad's death and when he passed the Slava day onto my cousin. Nowadays, when many family members live abroad and can't be reunited in Serbia, Slava represents the holiest day for gathering at the church or at the church hall with community members. Most important part of the celebration again becomes the liturgy and receiving the Eucharist on that day. This has increased the significance of Slava celebration amongst the Serbs. The place of Slava celebration is always holy, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them, Matthew 18.20, and God is everywhere, so may the Slava celebrations remain everlasting. Standing in the small chapel of Tumedulen in Endibra, people of 30 different nationalities with diverse personal backgrounds, native languages, customs, practices, characters and bodily characteristics are united into one through the worship of the liturgy. At the same time, each of them is not absorbed into the other, does not lose its distinct persona. They are singled parts of a whole and interdependent to each other at the same time because of their asking for a more direct dialogue with the divine through communal acts of faith. The chapel is placed, it is placed in the urban fabric of Endibra, and the sign on it says the Orthodox Church of St. Andrea. But can we disconnect the chapel from its liturgical interrelationship with the rest of the city? Is the door and the sign on it the line where the sanctity of the liturgical act stops? Connecting words such as and, after, before, besides, parallel, acquire a new meaning of union in the belief context of the church and allow us to further develop an argument about a city as an assemblage of different interconnected liturgical acts or faith acts, if you want, taking place at the same time. This becomes even more prevalent in the case of a missionary transnational Paris, allowing for moving individual to remedy and rebuild their identity without losing personal integrity and feeling of belonging in a communal here and now. For Milina Ivanovich Barishic, Slava is a ritual that deeply permeates the social and spiritual life of the Serbs and marks kinship, coexistence and religious qualities of being together and belonging that involves both the living and the dead of Serbian nationality or not. The ritual starts from the church with the blessing of the offerings and extends to the city, especially in the examen of the case par examen Paris. The example of Slava disconnects from strict nationality limits and is resituated in a Eucharistic Orthodox identity. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Um, it, it, it's amazingly uh, focused, if I may say, and incredibly interesting. It would be also very useful um, to hear a little bit more about context um, of Slava in its more traditional kind of uh, uh, historic circumstance. But um, can I can I open the floor to questions? And thank you so much, Christos, for uh, uh, sharing that with us. Wonderful. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Father Antonius, for your wonderful presentation. Indeed, as Eric said, very focused and focused on the most important uh, thing, if I may say, so the, the, which is really the Eucharist. There is uh, something that um, I'm intrigued about, and it has to do with, uh, um, and you started with that when you mentioned union very quickly. Um, and I would uh, say that when it comes to union, of course, this is very important, and certainly uh, in the Orthodox faith, uh, not least when it comes to sanctification, sanctification. Uh, but when it comes to the the, the Eucharist, uh, I would argue that um, um, following the uh, contribution also of the West to uh, this um, particular uh, question of union, that I would argue that God is near. God is near, and yet uh, there is a distance, and that distance comes from our lack of uh, uh, cooperation with his work, uh, the distractions that affect us uh, on a daily uh, basis, the sins even, the falls uh, of uh, our daily affairs. And yet, um, overcoming all those uh, through grace, there is a theological difference that remains. Um, God is near, but nearness does not mean consubstantiality. And there, um, I would very much like to hear what you have to say. Uh, communion being such an important part uh, of, uh, as you said it, uh, the um, Eucharist of the celebration of the Divine Liturgy. Um, that communion is only possible really through Christ. And I am quite puzzled uh, by the uh, word sinechez. Uh, and you will forgive me my, my very bad uh, pronunciation, uh, which I'm drawing now from uh, uh, people like Aristotle and so forth, uh, who were then eventually also um, crucial uh, for uh, the West. Uh, I, so it's it's really only a comment and, and more uh, of a, a series of pieces, pieces of the puzzle I'm trying to solve. But my argument would be that there is, yes, a theological difference that cannot be surpassed, and that nearness uh, always involves a relationship, and that relationship is the basis for communion. Uh, your comment, please. So that, that's between the, the, the so-called Eastern and Western traditions, am I right? It's more of a theological yes. question, so I would like to... Um, so, so for the orthodox faith our whole life is that's very theological now the discussion uh, is uh, a movement from the image of god to the likeness of god by grace not by nature uh, that image that that movement i'm sorry that journey uh, was uh, unlocked to us the gate was open with the um, the sacrifice and the resurrection of our lord jesus christ that as a fully human uh, met the absolute freedom uh, of uh, dying for the sake even of his enemies. Uh, there is a, a, we can become like God by grace. And you are right that that depends to how much we work on it. But what we do cannot limit the grace of God. So my response to you is that um, canons, institutions, and, uh, and belief systems and lines on buildings are created for us, the weak Christians, as the safe path towards God, but they're not created to limit the grace of God. So that's the theological part. In the same way, we believe that the Holy Communion is the closest, the absolute, the closest meeting with God that with with God that we can reach. To the as much as we can, as we say in the Tropar of Transfiguration, as much as they, we can, we are ready and we're prepared. But again, this cannot limit the grace of Lord in a creation 
and that involves built and unbuilt natural landscape, human and non-human, that we believe to be created by God. So I, I there is not a clear answer in in you in in, in what I'm saying. That's a comment more. Thank you. Not, Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you for, for those points. And uh, could we turn to Elizabeth, please? And delighted to have you with us again. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Father Antonio, thank you very much uh, for your lovely presentation. Earlier this afternoon, I was listening to another online lecture by the young scholar Robert Button, who was talking about particularly in the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, in a very early Christian text, how the Old Testament imagery of the cross, for instance, Moses standing with his arms outstretched, is seen as actually embodying, imaging in our body uh, the crucifixion and therefore, by extension, the, the crucified Christ. And it seemed that there was a remarkable echo, I thought, in what you were saying about bread, the, making the bread, uh, eating the bread, that in, in a very similar way, uh, through our use of the bread and our eating of it, we are embodying the, the incarnation, the presence of God in the material world. And I'm so glad you mentioned the use of sourdough because all sorts of things, not least about old New Testament bread imagery, started to make sense for me years ago when I was introduced to sourdough, which was in Greece. For one thing, the image of the leaven in the lump, because with sourdough, it's exactly the same substance. It's but vivified. Yeah. And and sourdough is part of a lineage. You know, you take a piece out of each lump of dough, which means that if you bake prospera, every loaf that you bake for home is the ancestor and the descendant of a prospera. And uh, I I knew a, a woman in Greece, the mother of a friend of mine, who would, if she had leftovers from a prospera, you know, she would make little sort of flatbreads, uh, which is almost a sort of pre antidora and it seems it, it's um, uh, you know a a a, a hallowing of the home uh, from. The baking of the the bread that's going to be consecrated, and I also finally I I will put into the chat uh, the reference to an article by my husband on the cosmology of the Eucharist, yes, which is yes. talking about the the background, uh, you know, from a scientific point of view, on the way that not just our homes and our agriculture, but in fact the whole universe is involved in the preparation of the Eucharist. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Just a, small, a, a very small point. We are grateful to God that in the Holy Communion, we are relating to the resurrected, not only crucified, the resurrected uh, body and blood of, the, of our Lord. It's, that's, it opens to salvation. And that there is something about the cold water that we add in the preparation and the warm water that is getting alive in the consecration that has that kind of symbolism of bringing it back to life. Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much. Looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> thank, thank you both. Okay, can we turn to Christian, please, who has a question? Hi, hi, uh, Crystal. That was fantastic. Really, really interesting. Um, I was interested you didn't use the term neoplatonic at all during the talk, because it seems to me that uh, the relationship of uh, movement and geometry, particularly in the way that the bread becomes a cube and the numerology is attached to what you called the crumbs and the mother of God all have a very geometrical um, shape to them. 
And it seems to me that that relationship between geometry and movement is, is a quintessential and critical part of the Neoplatonic aspect that's sort of inherited in the early church. Um, is, that, is that a fair assumption to make? Is it deliberate? Uh, it's deliberate that I'm not using Neoplatonic because I do believe that uh, um, the Orthodox Christianity suggests a much more immersed and fully em embodied. There are Neoplatonic elements, but it goes beyond that because it's fully body and soul, a more phenomenological understanding of the theological reality of the sacramental re reality. So deliberately, I don't use Neoplatonic uh, and I don't stick to the, um, the, the, the images and the, the, the images and the ideas, but I think these are all together one because I'll tell you something. Once I had, we had to serve with Bishop Raphael um, to Inverness and we forgot a loaf, to, 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 we forgot the offering. We had to stop and think what we're going to do. Of course, having a bishop is good, but um, we used, <laughs> yes, it's used. The bishop said that uh, use, go and buy a loaf from the supermarket and choreograph if you want on this kind of tabula rasa and a kind of a economia for the because they only had back then in Inverness once per per month at divine letter. They were waiting to receive Holy Communion. Uh, that is not anymore Neoplatonic. That goes beyond the Neoplatonic. That goes that goes to a transcendental reality that involves all of our senses now and here, to, and all, always in a future projection. So it's I, I deliberately do not use Neoplatonic. Um, That's in, it's interesting. It's interesting because I think I think one could argue that um, what you're objecting to with the use of the term Neoplatonic is an interpretation that perhaps. Um, Plato himself wasn't that keen on, but nevertheless, within the Platonic idea, is embodied exactly the themes that you're talking about. So the re rejection of the Neoplatonic is because it's not Platonic, and it's within the Platonic there is that transcendental. Yes, but it still gets to a point that it returns back to Platonic. I agree with you absolutely. Mm. I'm happy to to, co to continue that conversation because it's one of the things that they have. Uh... Thank you. It's really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm not sure I can see any further questions, but uh, James, um, James please. Oh, James. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. So thank thank you for your talk. I uh, you laid great emphasis on the Serbian Slava, um, which is something I've had personal experience of right. um, in a private home. Um, it, I hadn't realized that it was something that could also be worshipped communally in the church. And uh, you mentioned, I think, in passing at the end, um, the contrast between the, uh, the national significance of it and the universal orthodox significance of it. And I wonder whether you could expand on that a little bit. Yes. Uh, it yeah, seems I mean, to be a specifically Serbian thing, but you uh, you are not looking at it that way. There are a number of different things that we can discuss here. Two, actually, not a number, two different things. First of all, I have to tell you that uh, what I will tell you is based on, let's say, or ethnographic uh, uh, work or my pastoral, uh, from my pastoral experience in a lot of different multinational uh, um, uh, parishes in the UK. Um, there is a, there is a kind of um, in in the kind of uh, the former kind of uh, Yugoslavian environment. 
there is a kind of a, 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 relative, a, a bond that is called kum. Kubaros, you might remember the ones that have that are Greek or have heard about Greek origins. There is a kind of a non-blood relationship between people of the same area that become um, that decide to become as as close as blood family cousins. Kum is the is the word for cousins in the in that area. That uh, environment involved people of different nationalities and different religions. And you can imagine that even during the war, these relationships kept working secretly, of course, and in the Slava, these relationships were also served as part of the same family, even if they were not of the same religion. Sometimes they were Bosnians, uh, uh, Muslims uh, in this. Uh, now, that's the one thing that we have the Kumscapes, as I call them, back in this area where you have this kind of unbloody, uh, unblood uh, relationships that are materialized in different ways. And the other thing that happens is when you arrive at this new land where you come for a better future and you find yourself coming, yes, from Serbia, but um, having, for example, the Greek priest to serve the Slava that I had never served when I first served it, but I felt and I was included and included, fully included in, in, the, in the ritual, not because I was the priest serving or because I was the parishioner being there and also my name was given to be commemorated. It's because this ritual is part of the Eucharistic, part of the Eucharist. The liturgy after the liturgy, as uh, Archbishop Anastasios of um, Albania and then Ion Brya said, uh, have said, and have uh, Ion Brya has has published a book on this. Is that kind of the liturgical acts that are all encompassing? Yes, there are related. To the identity and the Serbian want to share the Slava, but in them, the whole universe, the whole creation is included by definition, and it's it and it's expressed very characteristically in the cum cum relationships that I described, which became a major geopolitical uh, issue back then uh, in the war. Um, uh, it, it, that that's the one thing, and the other thing is the universality of uh, of the connection to the Eucharist. Thank you. Um, I I hope that helps, James. Could we turn to uh, Veronica, please? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Father, for such an interesting and uh, informative talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, you you focused obviously on the uh, material aspects uh, of uh, uh, the Eucharist. Um, I was wondering, given uh, your interests in uh, soundscapes and um, in silence, uh, in silence more generally, uh, whether you have paid any attention uh, to uh, the uh, the role of, uh, of sound, of uh, uh, chanting, uh, and um, yeah, how, how you negotiate that in uh, like an international uh, context with uh, people coming from uh, different traditions, <laughs> but also, you know, uh, using, uh, being accustomed to uh, different types of, uh, of, of, of music. Um, one of the challenges I personally find, because uh, I also attend, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a member of uh, international parishes uh, here in, in my home country in Italy, uh, is, uh, yeah, this uh yeah combining all these uh this uh this uh this different sonic elements that's a very interesting question yes of course i have not only been challenged uh but i have um yes i have worked also on this um one thing is what metropolitan the late metropolitan Anthony bloom used to say that uh, he describes um, 
Metropolitan Anthony Bloom is, was uh, from the Russians of the diaspora. And uh, he says that when we arrived here, we had to get rid of all of the onion shaped domes and all of the beautiful music and all of, all of whatever and focus on the essentials. What is the essential? The essential is the Eucharist. What we all um, coming from the so-called Orthodox countries, you are, I know that you're a chanter as well. Uh, and, and I know that you're, you're sensitive. Your ears are, my ears, I don't have a good voice, so I'm not musical, so my ears are not sensitive at all. But, but, um, but what we have to, to learn, what we are asked to learn in these parishes is how to coexist. For the sake of what? Of the Eucharist is what we call the eschatological perspective. So yes, the table is not the right table for the proscomidia. The sound is never the right sound because it's all a mosaic academically as beautifully as it, is, as it might sound. It's challenging because it's stitched together. But if it's done in an, in an ethos of, be, of, of working with each other, of trying to put ourselves, at the, our voice under the voice of the other, and then it works. When it doesn't work as well, and, and I think even in a beautifully, um, even in a, in a Russian cathedral or in a Greek cathedral, if the the some of the choir knows that he or she has a good voice, if he or she knows it, we have a problem because that takes one voice above. It's not a coincidence that we use specific intonations to create a selfless, a sonic environment. The priest reads uh, melodically in a very specific, and you say, oh, Father Antonio sounds like uh, Father John Master or Father David Gill or Father Christian Axelberg. It's because the church suggests lose your ego, better lose your ego in this, um, in the stillness of, a, of an almost monophonic sonorous environment in order to allow for your senses to be concentrated on to the Eucharist, on the eschatology of the things. So it's challenging, but when it's done with the ethos of uh, living together for the sake of, of what is happening there, then the soundscape changes. It's stitched a bit. I know, it's challenging. Bear with it. <laughs> That's really interesting. Thank you very, very much. So thank you. Thank you enormously. I'm very interested in the issue of the, the kind of diaspora and the idea of pilgrimage um, and uh, this sort of sense of being out of one's place, um, uh, which seems to be part of part of the conversation. And then the, the critical issues of continuity of um, of idea and uh, yeah, of uh, liturgy in that textile, which is so extraordinary. Um, ah, the, the, yeah, the, the space, the, it's the, uh, the minimum space uh, that we need. Uh, and in Mensa. Um, uh, uh, so uh, thank you, you know, incredibly interesting. I don't know if anyone else has uh, added questions, but otherwise I think, um, we we thank you enormously. Um, thank you very I don't know much. whether whether from Edinburgh or Newcastle, but, um, but I'm at Newcastle at the moment. Yeah, wonderful landscapes that surround you, and uh, uh, we'll be thinking of that. And and uh, thank you so much for your contribution this evening. Thank, thank you. you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.